Andrew Collins, it's amazing to meet you in person. We had yep. an amazing uh, conversation the other night that was very fascinating. And a lot of people uh, respect your theories around here. I've been talking to a lot of people about uh, what you've been talking about, and I think you're very spot on because there's something missing from this community. There's something that people are not talking about, and I think that that is what you're talking about. I want you to explain that a little bit here. Yeah, Um I mean, I came into this believing that all UFOs were nuts and bolts, all aliens were flesh and blood, and that they were coming here from another planet, another solar system, uh, doing their thing and going back. But I think once I started investigating close encounters um, and reading the right books, essentially, you know, people like Jack Valley, John Keel, I realized that there's something missing, as you've just said. And, but it took me years to work this out. And the way that I came to it was after investigating the first ever full-blown abduction case in the UK, a whole family of five driving along, and they see this sort of UFO go across. They got excited about it. And they then go around a bend, and in front of them is this luminous bank of green mist, and the car headlights fail they can no longer hear the tires going over the road. Uh, the engine fails, uh, the car radio that, you know, fails as well. And they go into this bank of greenness, everything stops. The next thing they know, they're three quarters of a mile further on. They get home, they find that three hours are missing from their life. And they get quiet about it for a few years and then finally feel they've got to tell, you know, you know some kind of organization, UFO organization, they put them on to me, I investigate it. And eventually hypnotis reveals a sort of onboard experience. Um, but the, the, the thing is that the, the, the main guy involved, John Day, you know, he was never quite satisfied with this solution because he said, I never saw a, a, any UFO. I saw, all it was was this luminous bank of green mist. You know, yes, we'd seen this object earlier, but this, this was something different to what was going on. And the big query, question mark about this is that the three, there were three children in the back Two of them were asleep. One of them were, had their hand on the, the, the driver's seat and the passenger's seat. And when they came out three quarters of a mile further on, they're all in exactly the same position. And you think, well, did the aliens put them back in exactly the same place, make the two children go to sleep and make sure that the, 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 the child that was awake had one hand here and one hand? No. Clearly, they'd lost that time and presumably that space, if you like, instantaneously. And the, this made me think, well, what would have happened to them? If, if, they, if they were outside of normal space time for three hours, then where did they go? And I began to start to realize that experiences are happening beyond the physical in what I started to refer to as a bubble universe. In other words, something that opens up temporarily and that human consciousness interacts with this and perhaps even with the intelligence associated with these experiences. And you almost create like this living three-dimensional dream within that bubble universe for the time that you're there. And then at some point you're sort of regurgitated out of it, put back down and you've lost some time. And of course, we know that not only are there other, many other cases where people lose time, but also um, that people search the spot in between times and they're not there. I mean, Travis Walton is a classic example from, I think, 1975. There was a case in, um, in, in the UK where I come from where this, this scout, you know, lad about 14, is with a scout group. And, you know, he, he, he goes um, to have a, a sneaky cigarette, okay? And he's, <laughs> he gets one out of a, a pack of five. They used to have them back in them days. And he, he lights it, and then something wobbly happens. And the next thing he knows, it's dark. And one of his friends is saying, oh, you know, you, you, you better go come back to camp. You know, everybody's been looking for you. Sir has been trying to find you or whatever. And seven hours have gone. And yet he's still got the cigarette in his hand, and it's still alive. So how is that possible? Clearly, that seven hours went. And they, 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 they searched that spot. In between times, this guy had been uh, been lost for seven hours. Clearly, this is a child of 14. I mean, you know, the book was eventually written, I think, called The Missing Seven Hours, literally, obviously, in relation to, to the, the time that, that went. 
and I mean, uh, hypnosis revealed eventually it was an onboard experience and blah, 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 blah. But I mean, that's the problem that I have with hypnosis. Well, of course. I mean, I have the problem with it because, you know, quite clearly, false memory syndrome can provide a solution, an answer to why people come up with that or why they need to have that. But I also know cases, for instance, um, in southwest of England, near the Stone Circle complex of Avebury, where these people were on this this man-made mill hill called Silbury Hill. I mean, it dates to about 2000 BC. And they're there. They see these two lights come towards them. I mean, you know, literally across the field slowly. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're seeing them. And they eventually come to the base of the hill and they transform into two entities, two beings holding hands. I mean, this is three people. And these beings go back and become like balls of light. And then these balls of light start climbing the hill and they actually come level with them. And then these these balls of light just have this flash. And the next thing they know, you know, something like 45 minutes, they, they, they say had been lost in their life. Now, there's a lot of strangeness about this story, which you know, I haven't got time to go into. But I said to them, I said, have you done hypnosis? They said, no, 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 we don't want to. You know, we, we'd rather remember this as it is. And what happened was that, that two of the people who were, uh, you know, a man and wife, they became, became incredibly creative afterwards. They started making music and trying to express what had happened to them by creating their own music. And, you know, I mean, it was like techno or some trance stuff or whatever. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, you know, it was their way of getting out their system. Yeah. And this is what happens with so many. The family I told you about, the guy uh, became a sculptor of the most incredible metaphysical subjects. And before that, he was working in the factory. The wife, she was a mother uh, and wife. And suddenly she, her whole uh, career changed, she became a midwife and ended up in the Iraq war delivering babies. So, you know, I mean, you know, these people ha- go on to have remarkable lives. And I think that this is something that happens and has been going on in connection with, um, with these type of experiences, not just for a few thousand years, but, but I think since the beginning of humanity. I mean, the earliest evidence I've got of people interested in locations where lights are repeatedly seen is 400,000 years ago in Israel, a place called the Kazem Cave. And they're interested in this local mountain called Mount Gerizim, which in the book of Genesis is the mountain of God, the, the place that Abraham sets up the first altar and has this vision of, of, of God. And it's said that God manifests on this mountain in his form as the Shekinah. The Shekinah basically means the presence of God, but it generally refers to him as, as like a shining light, like Moses encountered on the top of Mount Sinai, or the light that appeared above the Ark of the Covenant. It's that type of manifestation. And this place still to this day produces UFO sightings. I climbed the mountain um, and there's this ancient community on the top of it uh, called the Samaritans. They believe themselves to be the true descendants of the Israelites. And I said to them, I said, you know, I, I found that the high priest said, you know, these lights, are they still seen it? Yeah, yeah, they're still seen. I said, how are they interpreted? And he said, Malachim, which means angels. So they see what we call UFOs as the angels of God. I mean, you know, I mean, to me, that's like something that should be in an an, an, an Eric von Daniken book on ancient astronauts. How incredible is that? We've rebranded the the whole Yeah, exactly. uh, Yeah, I mean, look, look, since 1947, we've seen this phenomena in association with uh, alien technology course but in the 1950s you had these adamski style scout craft and uh, if anybody was inside them they'd see pullers pulleys and handles and knobs and dials and whatever but then come into the 60s 70s the 80s they start becoming more ergonomic inside you know more touch screens and whatever and in, in many ways it sort of replicates the way that we see future technology on shows like uh, Star Trek, for instance. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you look at the original series of the 60s and obviously, let's say, Picard, you know, to die when they ultimately are only just a couple of hundred years away from each other time-wise, you know, and as far as the actual events that they're portraying. And yet, you know, now we couldn't possibly have a, uh, you know, um, uh, a, a 
um, you know, the enterprise sort of thing, looking like something out of the 1960s or whatever, you know, some yeah. our idea of future technology, like something like Epcot or something, at, you know, <laughs> Disney World, you know, that's yeah. so outdated, but it was supposed to be futuristic. Yeah. And, you know, now it just looks silly, basically. Um, and of course, that's exactly the same as a UFO. We see this as some kind of future alien technology, and this is the way that we want to perceive it. And I think that this is fine. I mean, if that's the way that people want to interact, perceive it, and accept its existence, then that's fine, but that's not the answer. Right. The answer is far, far deeper and far, far complex. And why do you think that it is, Andrew, that we have been the mass consciousness, the mass people on the planet have been perceiving these beings as physical. Do you think it's been because of the media, because of these movies and because, well, I mean, you look at Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, that book just reinforced the gray narrative, yep. the gray ET hypothesis when no one was talking about it before. So it seems like it's egregorical in nature, right? It's a plan. It's an idea and a thought that's been planted into the consciousness of people, and that idea and thought self replicates itself. Yeah, right? I mean, the, the first person that really started to realize this was Carl Jung, uh, towards the, the the end of the 1950s in the book Flying Saucers that he wrote. You know, he started to. He, you know, he didn't say that UFOs didn't exist. He did, but he said that they are a reflection of our technological age, particularly since the Second World War. And he's right. Of course he's right. You know, we are putting onto it what we imagine is there or what we want to be there, particularly at a time when we're now in the Cold War, you know, and, and, and you need this hope, this hope of something greater out there. And, of course, we saw that in terms of um, the Space Brothers, as they would have been seen. And I think that this is the way that, unfortunately, the phenomena responds to this so that, yes, it will appear as flying saucers. Yes, it will appear as alien technology to those that get close enough to, to, to perceive it. But whether any of that is real, I don't know. But what's also interesting is that the phenomena will, will also respond to other thoughts in relation to it. An example is Hestalen in Norway, where since the 1980s, Lots of strange lights, even more structured craft have been seen in this remote valley. And some of the, um, the, the, the observers there, scientific observers, have seen the lights. In a, I mean, on one occasion at Christmas, all the lights gathered together to form the shape of a Christmas tree. Now, tell me that's coincidence. Of course it's not. It's, but I don't think that the lights were deliberately saying, look, we know it's Christmas you know, we'll, we'll give, we'll put on a nice display for you and, and, you know, say happy Christmas. No, no, no. It's the fact that these people had Christmas on their mind. They had Christmas trees on their, and the national symbol of Norway is a Christmas tree or whatever. You know, it, it, it's clearly reflective of what is going on within the human psyche of those involved with these experiences. I mean, in the past, people would see lights, they'd come down and Jesus would would come out and say, come with me to the kingdom of heaven. And as we know, go back to medieval times, you're talking about fairy encounters. People would be walking across a field. They see this strange light. You know, maybe it had a doorway in it. They'd go inside it. Uh, and there were the fairies dancing and maybe eating. And, and somebody would dance with the fairies, uh, you know, for what seemed like an hour, let's say. And they come out and they find 100 years have gone by. Now, clearly, this is an exaggeration. But it's reflective, as Jacques Vallée said, of the modern day UFO encounter. Yes, it is very interesting. And I think that this is the direction that the community really needs to go in. Because whenever you really look down at it, there's zero proof and zero evidence of physical extraterrestrials. There's really none. There but people still believe that there are physical beings visiting us from yeah. other planets. But... I mean, let's, let's, let's try and, you know, put some reality on this. The fact is, UFOs exist. They are sentient. They seem to be intelligent. Beings manifest out of them. Those beings can take various forms, but often they are anthropomorphic. So what's going on here? Well, I think the key is plasma. 
plasma is the full state of matter. It's what you see. When you see a ball of light in the sky, that is plasma. And it's not just a nebulous ball. It can have incredible substance. Um, it can look like a flying saucer. Um, it can have extensions. I mean, it can be seen on radar. And it can definitely be sentient. And I mean, going back to the 1960s, theoretical physicist um, David Bowen worked with plasma environments you know, in, in the laboratory and concluded that they seem to come alive, literally. And he proposed that some kind of proto-intelligence, that was the term he used, was coming up from a, what he referred to as a deeper level of existence, one that was outside of normal space-time, to inhabit plasma environments. Um, and you know, work has been done on plasma since that time that seems to confirm that. But in addition to this, uh, various theoretical physicists have now proposed that plasma has an extra dimension of space. So not only is it the three that we know and love here in our reality, but there's an extra dimension involved. And if that's the case, then does plasma act as some kind of conduit, doorway, even a portal between our physical reality and a multidimensional realm? And this multidimensional realm, could that be where these entities are coming from? And in addition to that, is it possible that these conduits, these plasma conduits, could also link us with parallel worlds? Worlds that are similar to our own, maybe have slightly different laws of physics, where cryptids live or weird entities or whatever, and that somehow through that, they are able to enter into our realm through plasma environments. Plasma doesn't need to be visible either. Um, it's created within what's known as ions, on a, ionospheric environments. And these are generated by intense geology in the Earth, uh, involving everything from fault lines to tectonic plates to certain types of metals, you know, iron, mer uh, mercury, copper, certain types of stone and minerals such as uh, quartz, and tourmaline. And what these do is that they cause the release of electrons from atoms within the rock itself, and they come out to surface, and they create these heavy ionospheric environments, and plasma can quite literally congeal and burst into life and form, you know, objects, basically. Now, the most scientifically accepted form of those is what's known as earthquake lights, they often appear just before a major earthquake because the stresses and strains of the Earth is producing electricity, which is producing ionisation, which is producing these plasma. Recently, there were massive earthquakes in Turkey in February, just before it, mysterious lights. I was there just a couple of weeks ago. There was a pull of, of a UFO over an airport, a place called Gaziantep, right where the, uh, the, the, the earthquakes were taking place in February. Here was, was another thing. We were driving through the air at the time, and somebody said, uh, oh, does that mean there's going to be another earthquake? I said, no, of course not. You know, it, doesn't, it doesn't only mean that. One half hour later, somebody comes, there's just been a massive earthquake in that area. So, you know, this is confirmation to me, not only of the existence of earthquake lights, but the fact that the Earth generates the right environment into which these objects can manifest. That's the important thing. But they're not just objects, they're not just sentient, they're not just intelligent, but they themselves become the portals, the conduits, and the intelligence of them are almost like the guardians, if you like, of that conduit. And to try and find some kind of scientific explanation as to what's going on, you have to look at string theory. Now, string theory is complex, and we're not going to go into that, but... One version of string theory, which I think is really important to understand, it's called M theory. And this was brought to, together from at least, I think, five other variations of string theory by a guy called Ed Witten in the mid 1990s. And this suggests that before our physical universe existed, there was an 11 dimensional realm that they refer to as the bulk. And that within this bulk opened up these bubble-like universes, well, let's say one to start with, our own, that gradually expands. And its laws of physics were three dimensions of space, 
and one of time. But this sits within the bulk. But other universes can come into existence as well. They're called brains, as in membrane. And these membranes can open up and they can not just touch each other, but overlay each other. And if this is something that can be temporary, if you can imagine these two universes beginning to overlay each other, if you have these conduits, these plasma conduits, that allows some kind of connection between the two. And it may well be at these times that let's say cryptids or certain types of entities are able to cross through into our realm. Obviously, John Kill referred to them as ultra terrestrials. They're probably a very accurate term. And I think this is possible. And then, of course, when that overlay of those two universes then parts again, what it does is it pulls with it anything from that other universe. So it ceases to exist in our world. And of course, this would explain why so many cryptids um, are seen, that they're clearly physical, and then suddenly they just vanish into nowhere. I mean, there are reports of Bigfoot tracks that just stop. Reports of large felines, panthers, pumas, this, their, their, you know, the, there's their pads, their, their footprints, they just stop. Why do they just stop? Because that overlay between us and these other universes <laughs> at this point, you know, ceases. So they cease to exist within our reality. They, they can't be in a reality anymore because that connection between the two has gone, basically. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I think that's a really good place to end it. Thanks so much for uh, talking with me, Andrew. Really no, appreciate you. Yeah, I'd yeah. love to have you on my show so we can Let's have a longer uh, yeah, form yeah. conversation. I know you're a very busy man and you're taking yeah. care of business. Where can more people, if they would like to find out more information about your work, where can they find you? you have a website? Okay, yeah, I mean, like just, yeah, just andrewcollins.com. I mean, uh, you know, there's loads of, of articles on all of these subjects on there. Plus, that's one hat that I wear. The other hat that I wear is obviously looking at the origins of, of ancient civilizations, places like Gobekli Tepe, Karahan Tepe. You know, that's what my books are mostly about. But then I put the other hat on and write books like Light Quest, Origins of the Gods, Alien Energy, and stuff like this. So they're all interrelated in some way. Thanks so much. I really appreciate you a lot. And I'll get back in touch with you and we'll do a, a long form discussion of this because sure. I'd love to pick your brain. Yeah. And just so you guys know, they are not physical beings. I 100% believe that. Andrew believes that. And I think that we really need to get on that train because there's something really missing and people just regurgitate the same information over and over and over again. And we need to be supporting people like Andrew because he is uh, really on to something. And uh, check out his website. His website will be in the description of this video. Thanks for watching, everyone. Appreciate all of you. See you guys next time.